All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are here for our regular standing Thursday, Team Kentucky update. Uh, we'll have three speakers today. Uh, our theme of today's update are jobs, infrastructure, health, and education. We're gonna start with jobs. So last week uh, came right after the monthly KEDFA meeting. So we announced a number of great job creating projects across the state going everywhere from Eastern Kentucky in Beattyville to Katie's in Trigg County. And we had a number of our new CEOs uh, there with us. But I wanted today to put a spotlight on one that wasn't quite set as of last Thursday and was announced on Friday. And that's Connor Logistics Inc. that is relocating its corporate headquarters from California to Somerset. Connor Logistics Inc., or CLI, is a third-party logistics provider that partners with major national logistics companies to provide fulfillment, warehousing, transportation, and same-day courier services. Their Pulaski County headquarters is going to start with 20 quality job opportunities with strong wages for Kentucky residents, including executive and managerial positions. The new location is going to position CLI to better serve customers across the U.S., especially the eastern half of the country. It continues our wins on the logistics side because of our ability to reach a large portion of the population in a one-day drive. The project includes a starting investment of $1.3 million, but this is really just a start for here in Kentucky. The Connor family, who I had the privilege of meeting, uh, last week in Somerset uh, at the App Harvest announcement is moving themselves. It is exciting to have uh, this family running the company, moving its headquarters from a place like California and setting deep roots in our Commonwealth. And let me tell you, they have big plans that we talked about, and I can't wait to see their success. Distribution and logistics is more than just a key industry in the Commonwealth. It is one that is truly driving us. Kentucky is home to more than 580 distribution facilities that employ nearly 78,000 people. This is a substantial presence, and it's only getting bigger. Since the start of last year, distribution and logistics companies have announced 30 new location and expansion projects in Kentucky. Those are going to create roughly 2,000 new full-time jobs, and it's about $300 million of investment just in that industry. Past 15 months have highlighted the importance of the industry and its strength in the state, and companies like CLI will continue to play an important role as we uh, don't build back uh, where, where we surge past uh, even our pre-COVID economy. So I want to thank Sean and Megan Connor. It was great to meet them. They are excited. Uh, to be in the Commonwealth. That is neat to see. Group moving their headquarters. Truly uh, excited uh, about the opportunity, and we look forward to everything uh, that they are going to add to the Commonwealth. We say it uh, uh, each time, uh, but buckle up, Kentucky. Uh, we're going places. Uh, this month, we expect uh, some jobs announcements that are going to blow your socks off. Uh, they are really exciting, and they're just going to continue. And, and let me say that they're also happening all over the Commonwealth. The geographic distribution that we are seeing right now is more exciting than at any time uh, in my lifetime, and we are seeing companies that are expanding. And I think COVID was a big uh, uh, reason for that, uh, where they're willing to be, and that's to the benefit of so many of our communities. All right, second, I have great news to share regarding the growth of our high-tech businesses in our state. Remember, we don't just want jobs, we want jobs of the future. Uh, we want jobs that we know are going to exist decades from now. We have some incredible innovators here in the Commonwealth. One of the things we always talk about is needing to be um, uh, highly involved in those that are already here when most of our jobs come from expansions. And then there's the concept of how do we help uh, smaller or medium-sized companies then go really big knowing their home has been here. So I'm proud today that we're awarding nine tech-based companies a total of $900,000 through the Kentucky Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Matching Funds Program. That's all one title. That is a really long title. The program is designed to provide matching funds to for-profit Kentucky-based companies that have been granted awards through the federal SBIR-STTR program. 
So the state's matching funds complement nearly $4.8 million of federal funding awarded to these companies uh, through this program. This is an important uh, program for our state for a number of reasons. It promotes high-tech research, development, and commercialization right here in Kentucky, but it also helps provide terrific opportunities for our residents by spurring job creation in high-paying fields. I've said many times we have what it takes to establish Kentucky as a leader in technology as we move forward. This program is a key to doing it. Uh, just think about all the tech companies that started in somebody's garage. They've become almost legendary. They've even built out now uh, so much of the professional infrastructure of many of our cities around the country. We've got to make sure that our entrepreneurs are having these opportunities too. So I'm going to quickly run through the list of awardees for this cycle, as you can see, staggered around the state. They are Active Therapy Systems in Nicholasville, uh, Adel Adelphi Technology in Bowling Green, Health Tech Solutions, Inc., Omni Life in Lexington, uh, Hitron Technologies in Lexington, Inquiry Technologies in London, Kentucky Imaging Technologies in Louisville, MemStem in Louisville, Veriglow in Lexington, and Wild Dog Physics in Lexington. Uh, so these Kentucky-based companies, they're making amazing advancements in fields, and they span from cancer care to robotics to, to motion capture uh, technology. Uh, so I'd like to highlight the work of just a couple of them, again, to give an idea uh, for Kentuckians about some of the innovation that's, that's going on. So Active Therapy Systems, that's the one in Nicholasville, is developing technology to deliver personalized, automated, and adaptive physical therapies for people with Parkinson's disease, serving as a virtual coach for those patients. Meanwhile, Health Tech Solutions in Lexington is addressing the need for efficient communication software technology for organ procurement organizations and transplant centers. Those could significantly improve the use of donated kidneys and raise the number of viable, currently unused organs that could otherwise be successfully transplanted, reducing waste, but more importantly, saving lives. And then Kentucky Imaging Technologies out of Louisville is working to combat colorectal cancer by developing a system that more accurately detects polyps than a patient's colon with the ultimate aim of providing unprecedented accuracy in this area. These are important, potentially life-saving technologies, and they're happening right here. This is a program that hopefully helps take it to the next level. We look forward to one and or all these companies becoming that next technology juggernaut uh, right here in the Commonwealth. All right, so moving from jobs, job creation, to infrastructure. Uh, we've talked a whole lot about uh, some of the federal uh, infrastructure uh, through the American Rescue Plan Act. And let me today just briefly state uh, my support for the bipartisan, let me say that word again, bipartisan uh, uh, infrastructure uh, agreement uh, that needs to now work its way through as legislation in Washington, D.C. First, we need something bipartisan coming out of Washington, D.C. It'd be good for all of us. Uh, but the dollars that it puts into roads and bridges, and this morning we were unveiling electric buses through the Volkswagen settlement I did as Attorney General in Louisville. Um, it, it puts money into electrification. Uh, these are huge needs. Uh, that polling shows everybody uh, across America agrees with, regardless of party. Uh, we need that to, to move forward. But one way that we can make a better Kentucky uh, through our current means is by improving and maintaining our streets and roads and other parts of our transportation infrastructure. Today I'm happy to announce discretionary funding for 177 such projects in dozens of Kentucky cities and counties. These projects amount to more than $11.8 million, money that will be used to reimburse 46 local governments after they administer the work on these projects. Most of the projects involve resurfacing of deteriorated roadways. Local governments will be patching and sealing, completing storm drain projects, performing slide repairs, and in one case, adding a much-needed connector road for economic development. The funding brings our administration total to $17.3 million dollars thus far in discretionary spending in 2021, and $33.2 million since January of 2020. Today's projects were evaluated by the Transportation Cabinet staff, and they include things like safety, traffic volume, and economic impact. 
Local governments then apply for the funding from the Department of Rural and Municipal Aid within the Transportation Cabinet. So again, let me just cite a few examples of how we're using these money, uh, monies to, to ultimately uh, build up the infrastructure in, in needed areas in Kentucky. So let's start in the city of Cynthiana. Waterworks Avenue in Cynthiana has been heavily damaged by flooding on the South Licking River. Erosion of the embankment has been so severe that this city street has been reduced to one lane of traffic. So we've announced um, our approval of $211,325 for repairs and stabilization of that road in Cynthiana. In Bourbon County, a second access road is badly needed to and from the rapidly growing Paris Bourbon County Industrial Park. Getting that next uh, job creator, that next business to move to an industrial park requires that we have the necessary infrastructure to it. So we've approved $575,000 for the construction of a half mile extension that will connect an existing industrial park road with the Paris Bypass, which is US 68. That's going to help with increased freight traffic, also employee traffic. One more quick example. In the city of Warsaw, we've approved $162,000 towards the cost of new storm drains on East Main Street. That's the type of infrastructure that's essential to health, to safety, and we've seen far too many of our cities and towns actually underwater in the last year. Uh, this is making sure that that's not going to continue. So let's move to health. We've gone from jobs to infrastructure to health. And yes, we're going to focus uh, significantly today uh, on COVID and some uh, really good news first that came out about immunity and how long it may last. So on Monday, scientists reported that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine set off a persistent immune reaction in the body, which may protect individuals from COVID-19 for years. I just want everybody to think about that, right? We ended up with vaccines in less than a year after a one in every hundred year pandemic hit. That is a miracle. Second miracle on top of it is how effective they were. We were hoping for something maybe like the flu shot and we got 90 plus percent effective and now 88 percent effective against the Delta variant after your second shot. And that's even the most aggressive variant. But this new news, again, if it holds and they don't have data for the J&J &J vaccine, means on the first try we not only got vaccines, some of the most effective vaccines ever, we got vaccines that may last for years. That is really exciting. It suggests the majority of vaccinated people will be protected in the long term, and it may impact whether boosters are needed. So this is exciting new information. And again, it says that uh, the scientists are doing the work. Uh, the companies are developing boosters as needed. We certainly hope this um, is, is proven out by uh, more studies, but very, very exciting. Second piece, and I know that came up this week with the WHO, but the CDC director reaffirms that vaccinated people in the U.S. don't need masks in most situations. You may choose to wear one. You can think through the, the risks that you are uh, willing to take or to not take, and then your own personal health, um, your immune system, is something that you ought to factor in. But on Wednesday, CDC director um, Walensky Reconfirm that fully vaccinated people do not need to wear masks in most situations. WHO makes recommendations for the entire world. And we're blessed in the United States, whether it is um, uh, the hospitals that we would go to, the care that we can get, uh, the treatments uh, that we have, the vaccine distribution network that we have all built. Uh, that makes us far more fortunate than just about anywhere else in the world. It's understandable that the WHO may have a slightly different recommendation or may need to make a recommendation that is different than what we have in the United States. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Eric Friedlander, who is going to give some more vaccine information and I think a couple of other things. We will then hear from our Lieutenant Governor on um, education. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, as always, for your leadership. Uh, uh, we have gotten through this or getting through this, and we get through this together because of that. Um, first, uh, I'd like to say uh, with relative to the masks, and if we can get the first slide, that would be great. Um, it, is, it is a decision, um, uh, in most cases a personal decision. 
Uh, and uh, one way you can make an informed decision about that, and it's a way that I do it, is I go to the KY COVID-19 website and look at our county positivity rates and look at our uh, uh, county vaccination rates, and I'll make a decision about that, even though I'm fully vaccinated, about whether I'll wear a mask or not. The other thing is the governor mentioned there are some certain areas like health care uh, as well as public transportation where we're still asking people to wear masks. I was walking into a health care facility the other day, got almost to the door and had to turn around and go back to my car and get my mask. Um, so, uh, but I did go back to my car and I did get my mask and I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, I too have a theme today. My theme today is get vaccinated. <laughs> You're going to hear this again and again and again as I talk. Um, this slide shows how important it is for us to get vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, as the governor said, these are scientific miracles. If we get vaccinated, we drive down these rates. We drive down hospitalizations. This is the most effective thing you can do. Get vaccinated. We have a positivity rate that is stable. Uh, yesterday we were at 1.98 percent, a, a good number, and we've continued to see the week over week declines. I think we're going to see a stable week coming up next, but that says what that should say to us all is get vaccinated. It is important for us to do that. That's what's driving this number. That's what's driving this number. So when appropriate wearing masks, making sure we get vaccinated. These are the most important things we can do. And we've been doing well in Kentucky. Um, we are about middle of the pack in terms of states and, and vaccination rates. It's important that we do that. Um, and so to that end, to say, get vaccinated, um, I wanna give you a little update on the shot at a million. This is a very important thing that we're doing. We had over 121,000, almost 122,000 people get shots since the time we announced. This has been an important way to drive that vaccination. Uh, so know that, that that still exists. We had a drawing. Uh, tomorrow, we believe we will be making an announcement, hopefully around this time, uh, around our winners, the winners of a million dollars, right? The best chance you have at winning a million dollars is getting vaccinated and signing up. The, the youth, uh, young adults that are going to have a free education, your best shot at that, besides uh, academic talent, um, is uh, to get vaccinated. We must drive those numbers, and we will continue to drive those numbers. So we've made a drawing yesterday. You're not too late. We have two more drawings. You can get vaccinated and participate in this vaccination drive, in the shot at a million, in the shot at free education. Um, now I need my glasses because I have to tell you the day. Um, but uh, if we get an entry in by the end of Wednesday, July 28th, 1159, um, and the drawing date will be that next day on Thursday, and we'll announce on Friday like we're doing this week. There's another chance at it. The other chance is August 25th, again, that midnight timeline, uh, as well as then the drawing on Thursday the 26th and the announcement on Friday the 27th. Folks, get vaccinated. It is the way we return to normal. It, it is the way that we avoid some of those weird things that have been happening out there with, with all sorts of uh, groups and teams and things like that. Get vaccinated. It's how you protect yourself. As the governor said, it is a miracle how effective these vaccines are. It's a miracle now. We're starting to see there is potential for long-term safety, long-term protection with these vaccines. And they're so safe. They are, they are as safe as any vaccine we have developed. This is an important thing for all of us to do. So uh, I hope you got my theme, get vaccinated. Uh, and uh, it is my pleasure right now to uh, introduce the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Coleman, who has truly, truly been a joy to work with as we talk about career pathways, working on uh, issues in education, to have somebody of her skill, talent, and knowledge we are very fortunate in this state.
didn't even pay him to say that. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you all today to share a bit of an education update and some athletic updates that are really exciting for the state of Kentucky as well. Uh, so in response to the coronavirus, um, everyone knows that our, our schools um, are experiencing an influx of funding from the federal government. Uh, and that increased funding is vital uh, because we are working to build a better Kentucky for everyone. And the important part about this funding is it cannot end at the classroom door. Our kids, uh, our students have to be uh, supported holistically, both in and out of the classroom, if we truly want them to be successful. And so we have to take a look at this funding through fresh eyes and this new perspective that this pandemic has given us. And if you recall, back in May, uh, Governor Bashir announced our proposed budget for Kentucky's Gear 2 funding. That's the governor's discretionary spending. Out of a total of $19 million, $4 million of that has been earmarked for higher education uh, for the purpose of assisting students in need to transition to college uh, and retain them once they get to college and provide college and career counselors. And the, the critical point here is that we know that our students were outside of school buildings um, for the better part of a year. And so what the governor and I were focused on is uh, the students who, who were most in need um, probably had the least access to college and career counseling. And so we wanted to make sure that these bridge programs were in place to support these students to get to college, but also to stay there and to be supported while, the, while they are there. Uh, 15 million uh, of those dollars is going to be given to our family resource and youth service centers through a competitive grant process. Uh, and I'm gonna give you uh, an idea of where these dollars are going. Um, just to give you an idea of how great the need actually is, uh, we were able to award dollars to 150 recipients, that's 150 individual schools uh, throughout Kentucky, but we received 215 applications. So the need is great um, for sure, but there, there have been 150 centers that have been chosen to receive this funding and they will utilize the dollars in, in one of a few ways. One is to invest in early childhood education, uh, and uh, also to invest in family crisis and mental health counseling for every age group of students and families. Uh, the value that our Friskies have uh, to our schools and our communities is absolutely immeasurable. I wish more Kentuckians and more folks in the public knew what happened uh, in those centers um, uh, within our schools because the support they provide to our students is is remarkable. Uh, these are the folks that stand in the gap for our kids who are most in need, and they serve as the home school community uh, connection for so many more. So providing these services to Friskies is actually going to have a compounding effect. It's gonna create a ripple effect throughout the communities. Uh, because if Friskies have the dollars they need to support these critical services for our kids and their families, uh, then they'll also be able to build community partnerships and bridge those partnerships with the schools. And here's the best news, when they do that, it frees up teachers to teach which is what we want happening and making sure that teachers have the ability to do that and focus on curriculum uh, when the kids are in their classroom. We know not every, uh, every family has access to equitable full-time childcare and the pandemic has proven that this, this has been uh, specifically a detriment to women. Uh, in the workforce. Um, whether we have Kentuckians entering or re-entering the workforce, uh, we wanna make sure that they have the support they need for their families as well. So with this funding, our Family Resource Youth Service Centers will coordinate and develop resources and support for full-time childcare, as well as health services that are critical to uh, the early development of our littlest learners. So I'll give you a couple of examples from a couple of the centers. First is in Warren County. Warren County uh, school system is going to address the early childhood education uh, challenge with these dollars and they are going to utilize this funding to almost double the, the little learners in-home education program and they'll be able to now help 70 families uh, because of this funding. They're going to be using research-based parents as teachers curriculum and the program seeks to increase the number of children entering kindergarten ready to learn. 
Uh, alongside early childhood education, our Frisky grants will also go towards, again, the mental health services for families and students. Uh, and so in McCracken County, the, the school's kid, excuse me, McCracken County School's Kids First Family Resource Center uh, will pilot a school-based mental health counseling program that will include small group therapy and social and emotional learning activities for students and training for teachers and administration to increase student support, which is so critical uh, as well. So with these grants, we're gonna be able to identify and coordinate services for grief, illness, trauma, isolation, anxiety, and so much more. And so this gear funding will take us closer to a world-class education system that serves the whole child, which is so critically important. Uh, so the dollars, while they're critical to address the needs that exist now, uh, they're also critical in making sure that we address the issues that were exacerbated by the pandemic and to move us forward into a brighter future. So I want to say congratulations to all 150 uh, Family Resource Youth Service Centers uh, across the state who were uh, winners of this uh, grant that we were able to award. So thank you um, for being uh, involved in that. So next up. This is really exciting. Uh, we have some really great uh, news for the Olympics from Kentucky. Uh, former University of Kentucky uh, track star Sydney McLaughlin had a world record performance on Sunday when she qualified for the Tokyo Olympics. Sydney, who is 21, became the first woman in history to run the 400 meter hurdles in under 52 seconds. I ran track in high school and I did not come close to a 52 second 400 without hurdles. So how she did that, I have, I have no idea, but that's pretty impressive. Um, also, we have Kendra Harrison, who is also a former UK star. She dominated the women's 100 hurdles uh, as she also moves on to Tokyo in the Olympics. And both of these women uh, ran the fastest races ever in both major women's hurdles events. So that's really something to celebrate here in Kentucky. All right, I'm going to turn it right back over to Governor Bashir. Thank you all. I was not asked to run track in high school. <laughs> and while um, I was on a baseball team for a couple of years, I'd never say I played. That is an operative verb that did not apply to my service on that team. All right, uh, so today, um, for, for those watching, we are back in our normal briefing room. Uh, Capitol um, is is now uh, open to the public, and if you are in this building, you're going to notice something new, at least in one hallway that's going to spread out. You will notice Kentucky art uh, is being uh, hung in our hallways. It's an honor to showcase the incredible artists of Kentucky, and if you get a chance to visit, it's incredible. Uh, one of the paintings hanging up just sold for $38,000 as it was being transported to us. Now that we've made it past the crisis of the pandemic and visitors can come see our capital while they're here, kids or adults, this is the one that sold, uh, they can get an opportunity to see the incredible artwork uh, of Kentuckians all over the state. What you'll see are these pieces. You'll also see um, who painted them and where they are from across uh, Kentucky. This artwork is called the Team Kentucky Gallery, and it's going to rotate every six months. And already, <laughs> we have a whole lot hanging in the one hall because we had trouble saying no the first time. But already, there are um, a huge uh, interest in the next uh, six months. And we're going to try to work in some, some different groups that also create art uh, themselves. The first display will last today from July 1st to December 31st. These works are also featured in a Team Kentucky digital art gallery. We're excited, you know, now we need to provide some of the experience you get here uh, digitally and online. So for more information about the gallery or to submit an artwork for the next rotation, visit governor.ky.gov forward slash gallery. And I will tell you, I mean, we, 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 in, in, in walking oftentimes alone during this pandemic, um, these halls for uh, the last uh, year and a half, um, the, 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 the color of these paintings, the uh, incredible artwork that's come up has given a new energy, I think, to those working in the Capitol or hopefully coming in. 
All right, and finally, before we turn it over to questions, uh, last week I already made my first mistake in our Team Kentucky updates by failing to talk about the Team Kentucky All-Stars, which I said I'd talk about at the end of each one. Uh, today's All-Stars, uh, we had mentioned on social media, but because I didn't get it out last week, Prince Harry beat it to me this week. So first, I want to recognize Jacqueline Teague and uh, Amelie Beck, two Kentucky high schoolers at Sacred Heart Academy who founded Vax Connect KY. Through Vax Connect KY, they've assisted nearly 1,000 senior citizens in Kentucky, 1,000 of the people most at risk with signing up for vaccine appointments. In addition, they help plan a vaccine clinic for their school, and they're using their platform to encourage other students their age to sign up for their shot of hope. Their work was recently recognized by Prince Harry when Jacqueline won the Diana Award named after Princess Diana. Hearing from your governor is nowhere near that cool. I get that. But I wanted to make sure that we recognize these uh, uh, two um, young women, these two incredible Kentuckians, for taking the initiative on their own to go above and beyond in helping protect people's lives and save people's lives. They are truly Team Kentucky All-Stars, and they're showing that you're never too young to lead, ever. And what they have done here during the midst of this pandemic is something truly special. Uh, separately, um, in addition to uh, the, the athletes that the Lieutenant Governor named, I want to congratulate the nearly 30 Team Kentucky athletes who qualified for the Summer Olympics in Tokyo. They'll complete, they're they're going to compete in fencing, field hockey, rifle events, softball, swimming, track and field, basketball, golf, and Paralympic hand cycling. We're going to be cheering for them, and it's exciting that just about any night of the Olympics that we flip on, there may well be a Kentuckian uh, or someone with Kentucky ties up there competing. All right, so if that, we'll open it up to questions. And the way that we're, we're, we're going to continue to go is, is by those that have um, RSVP'd, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. I think we've seen that we'll get everybody's questions answered, but making sure that we don't leave anybody out. And so our, our earliest one is, is Debbie Yetter from the Courier Journal. Um, today was the uh, deadline for the contract situation with Sunrise Services. Can you say whether that's been resolved or that issue's still hanging? Uh, so since the Supreme Court decision, while it might not be directly on point, is pretty close, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services has offered uh, the contract in the form that Sunrise had previously requested it uh, with uh, specifically uh, a line in two different sections eliminated. Sunrise has responded by saying uh, that's no longer their position and they now want significant additional terms written into the contract. So at this point there is not resolution but they have the contract they asked for right there ready to sign if they're willing. Um, Alex from the Herald Leader. Um, yesterday the cabinet told me that 23 cases of the Delta variant have been confirmed in Kentucky which isn't a ton obviously. Can you say where those cases were, whether any of the people diagnosed were vaccinated? And I guess what would have to happen, your office said that you all aren't reconsidering mass guidance at this point. What would have to happen for you to reconsider reissuing a recommendation? So we'll see which of that information we can get you. One thing that we'll try to check is, is vaccinated versus unvaccinated with that. Um, can you put up the, the case chart? So what we've got going on right now that's a little different than some states, but, but we're pretty excited about, is, is our trends continue to be really positive, uh, by which I mean they're declining. Uh, in this pandemic, negative is, is, is positive. So we've got cases declining. We continue having people sign up for vaccinations. Um, we're, we're outdoing many, most of our, our surrounding states, but not all. Uh, our positivity rate is under two. You know, to reconsider, we'd have to see um, those trends certainly turn around, uh, and, and we'd have to see a concern that we believe uh, would be more than temporary. Uh, the thing we're going to get to do is we're going to get to see in other countries, again, whose vaccination rates aren't nearly uh, what ours are, what happens. And so we'll also be looking uh, at that. Now, we're going to watch this carefully. What I can tell people is the Delta variant, yes, it's scarier than the ones that have come before, but if you get both shots of the Pfizer, the Moderna, after that second shot, you're 88% safe. That's better than just about every vaccine on the market. So please go out and get your second shot. Karen Czar. Governor, obviously with the mask uh, mandate ending and everything, it's, there'll be three weeks tomorrow. 
a lot of people um, I've talked to who are concerned have said, well, now it, it is difficult to know. You, can't, you don't know who's vaccinated and who isn't. So you've been traveling a lot more in the last few right. weeks. Uh, how have you and your staff personally mm -hmm. felt safety-wise, and do you have any messages going into the holiday weekend? So I have been traveling uh, the last three weeks, and it's about my, my personal mask use and, and how I feel and messages going into the holiday weekend. Um, I feel comfortable in most settings because I know what the vaccine does for me how safe it makes me, how um, much less likely it means that I will contract the virus or to be able to bring it home to my kids. Especially in the last uh, uh, three weeks, um, I've worn a mask very rarely. And part of that is a decision um, about wanting to show people that I think that the vaccines are effective uh, and, and safe. Uh, there are settings where I do wear it. Uh, and I wear that for other people who are in the settings. They are medical settings, so we've gone to a number of treatment centers um, uh, where we've worn it. Um, if I went into TARC this morning, being a public transportation place, we did it outside, uh, would have worn it uh, there. But what I would say to people heading into the, to the, the holidays is if you are vaccinated, you are pretty safe. But if you get nervous, you can put on that mask. Second, get online. You can look wherever you're going. You can look if you're going on vacation in another state, look up the county, see the positivity rate, see the vaccination rate. And most places in Kentucky, you're going to be better off here than, than there, but we get that people are, are moving around and make a decision uh, from, from there. Um, it may be when we uh, get a chance to go on vacation, depending on where we go, that I'll wear one depending on, on what I see there. But on the flip side, if you are unvaccinated, there's a Delta vi uh, variant out there, and y you should really consider wearing a mask because you are not uh, protected, and uh, the current variant um, will hit you harder even if you're younger. So uh, <laughs> the answer is get vaccinated. Tom? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon to you. Um, I want to follow up on what Debbie asked you. And what were the provisions that changed? Oh, they weren't provisions that changed. They are new provisions that are being asked for. Uh, about nothing in the contract will be enforced if it violates A, B, C, or D. Well, if it violates A, B, C, or D, it's already not enforceable. Uh, um, uh, I think they, they, they want a new like preamble about who they are and, and, and what it means. And listen, I'm not trying to make light of any of that, but what we were told and what I believe from the organization itself is that they want to serve kids. And that if we eliminated this language that we were worried violates federal law and now we know doesn't, that they'd sign the contract and, and accept services for kids. And so I hope they'll put those kids first. That language no longer appears in the contract they've been offered. But this isn't a, a chance to negotiate for more on top of something. You, you, you've gotten what you've asked for. Uh, let's make sure that we can serve them. What's uh, the date at which the we're, service we're still We're still placing kids there. Okay. So. I yeah, we're not we're not we're not cutting that off at, at the moment. Kids are still being placed there, and uh, you know I think Sunrise has been um, uh, you know, a, a a good provider of many services. I will say that there is capacity in this state to make sure that every child that needs help is helped uh, with or without them. Uh, again, um, the contract that they've asked for, where we always said we were going to look at, at 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 what federal law is, we've gotten confirmation. They've been offered. So, you know, I, I hope this is about the kids and, and not trying to make bigger. Um, um, I hope I hope it's about the kids. Yeah. Hi, Governor. Um, I know earlier this year, back in April, you did about $5 million, um, in funding for the traditional infrastructure like roads. Um, but this additional uh, funding, is this a matter of taking it into your own hands um, and not wanting to wait for the federal government to finish their infrastructure talks? So the, the dollars we put out today are discretionary funds provided to the transportation cabinet and the governor under the state budget. Uh, they're provided that way uh, in each and every budget, though over time um, they've, they've shrank in, in size. Um, what they are for is for uh, uh, projects that typically are smaller, uh, but oftentimes the need has arisen faster. I think that's Cynthiana Project, where we've talked about a road now being down uh, to, to one lane. Uh, the, the federal infrastructure dollars we expect to be for much bigger things. I certainly hope that the Brent Spence Bridge is written into any legislation, for instance, uh, because only a small portion of the traffic going over it is Kentucky uh, and Ohio. Uh, a lot of that's needed for major bridge, uh, major road work. These projects are, are much smaller and we would handle through the state in this way. 
follow-up. Um, do you know how many unemployed people receiving benefits so far have taken advantage of that uh, that incentive that you just added, the one-time payments? So the question is the, the back-to-work incentive that was requested uh, from our, our business leaders. In fact, UPS is, is now pushing it out as one. Uh, Houchins uh, was on our original uh, release, and, and the applications for it aren't open yet because of how long the people have to go in. But we've had um, some early data from uh, a couple of different sources, and these are of some folks in the room. Can we put that up, James? The first is the New York Times took a look at states that simply cut off the extra $300. They mainly started with Missouri, and what have they found? They found that it did not increase people looking for jobs. In other words, they cut $300 out of people who'd lost their child care, single, moms and, and dads, uh, people who were immunocompromised that really needed that, they cut that out. I guess they were worried about some people who just didn't want to go back to work, and what they have found is the, uh, the online searches did not go up and, in fact, are below the national average. If what we do is not about red or blue, Democrat or Republican, it's about policy over politics, we should want to do things that work. And the early data coming in is cutting those benefits doesn't work. On the flip end, and this is just uh, one company, um, uh, they are seeing, um, uh, they said, a, a ton of applications right after the announcement. Listen, it's too early to, to tell. Uh, these are obviously, this is anecdotal. Um, uh, the New York Times is, is, is a little broader than that. Uh, but we think that, that businesses certainly are excited when they talk to us about it. And that even ranges from business groups that don't like the $300 to, 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 to begin with. Um, supported um, widely out there, and we think that it is going uh, to work. Now, again, it can stir a lot of emotions. It might not be individually uh, the most popular thing, but by now I'm used to making unpopular decisions, and if it helps us get where we need our economy to go, while at the same time not hurting people that are still reeling from this pandemic and continuing to provide the $34 million every week into our economy to places like restaurants uh, and retail that got hit so hard, you know, it, it appears that this is the correct direction. We're going to continue to watch it. We're going to continue to be flexible. Let me go to Melissa, and then we'll we'll, we'll come around for second questions. Mm -hmm. well, um, so you've said that the COVID numbers continue to decrease, but our numbers show that they're actually just ticking up a little bit, um, and that they the seven-day average had an increase of 12% yesterday. And so I'm just curious you can speak to that um, and, and what metrics yeah. do we need to be looking at to, to, to establish a level of concern right now? Well, we, we wait the full week um, because, uh, if, as you've noticed, how the numbers are coming in is changing and, and hadn't, hadn't fully leveled out. Um, uh, and that's the weekends that we used to be working when the pandemic was at its height. Um, we, we would get real numbers Saturday and, and Sunday. You know, there was a Monday where we had less than 100 for the first time, but the next day you, you saw more. So we're, we're going to wait until our typical time to, to, to compare weeks, but we're going to need to see a trend. Um, and then the trend's going to have to be uh, concerning enough uh, to take any additional action. And, and as our vaccination numbers continue to increase, um, that'll, be, that'll be how we assess the threat, too. Um, as it goes. But we are going to have to judge in any of that. And what we would ask people that are already protected from this to do for those that are unwilling to protect themselves. I mean, that is another consideration that we that we have to take into account. Uh, let's see. Uh, Phil? There are still some uh, health care providers in the state, maybe all of them, they're requiring you to get a test and then be quarantined it's some procedures and they don't even ask if you've been vaccinated or not. Huh. Is that a concern of yours that when you go in for a procedure, like an outpatient procedure, right. there's no questions. Some people have told me this, is, this, this has happened. They don't even ask if they're vaccinated, but you still have to be a test. Like the vaccinations don't even matter. Uh, is that a concern of yours? Well, it, this is the first I've heard of it. And I would want to talk to those providers just to, to, to know what's behind uh, those decisions. If, if they have a worry about what it would do to workforce, and the number of people that may be waiting on procedures or, or outpatient. But without more information, I, I want to make sure I talk to them. You know, certainly there's, there's a huge difference if you're vaccinated and unvaccinated, so I'd want to hear what those reasons are. At the same time, 
um, I want to give a lot of flexibility to our health care providers who have lived this thing every day, have seen what it does, um, and I don't want to I don't want to judge cautious decisions they make uh, until we uh, until we we truly know the the why. Uh, let's see, do we have Michael Cadigan? Yeah, yeah Michael. Uh, so with the uh, tragedy down in Surfside, Florida, with the older yeah. uh, condo building, what kind of um, protocols are in place in Kentucky to kind of see similar age buildings and make sure that they're up to code where we don't yeah. see that tragedy happening here. Yeah, what happened um, in in South Florida with that building is a tragedy. In fact, um, I have a friend whose wife was in that building and thus far uh, has not been uh, located. Uh, certainly, we have um, housing building construction, uh, different areas uh, in our state government and local um, that, that do this work. We are redoubling. Looking back, we're going to try to make sure while this didn't occur here that we learn lessons from it um, uh, about what extra needs to, to, to be done. It is, you see the pictures and it's almost hard to believe that a building could collapse in the United States of America. And uh, we need to make sure certainly here in Kentucky, which I'm responsible for, that we're not cutting corners and that doesn't happen here. All right, anybody I missed? Okay, we'll come back. Yeah. Um, Charles Booker announced his candidacy mm -hmm. this morning to unseat Rand Paul. Are you going to publicly endorse him? I believe that Charles Booker is a strong candidate. I believe he is uh, very passionate. He has put a very good, very professional team around him. Uh, since I've become governor, I've not endorsed in a single primary, um, and it is still really early. But I don't want that to be confused. Um, uh, or there to be any question that I don't think that Charles Booker is a very good candidate. Yes? Governor, I've gotten questions from several organizations for meeting with their boards and planning events coming up late summer, early fall, and figuring out their protocols safety-wise. Mm -hmm. There's been a, uh, some confusion and concern. Can they legally ask people to prove they are vaccinated in order to participate? Can they not? What do you say to them? Uh, I, I have not seen a single decision, um, and certainly there isn't a, a law that I'm aware of on the books that would prevent a private entity or a private event uh, from requiring people to be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, can we go back to just talking about COVID for a little bit? A lot of people have kind of put it behind them um, with the fact that so many people are vaccinated. Why is it so important for you to continue having these weekly briefings and to continue talking about the data, even though we're trending downward? So we, we saw during COVID uh, that there was a real uh, hunger um, and, and need uh, for uh, myself and the administration uh, to be able to both directly communicate to Kentuckians about of things going on, COVID being the most important uh, at that time, while at the same time uh, ensuring that, that we uh, involve an, an independent media and, and how we do that. Um, we, we are continuing um, that by having a standing weekly um, press briefing uh, and, and Team Kentucky briefing, which is what we're doing here. I believe I'm the first governor to, to do that. What that does is, is let us talk about things that we're excited about or um, that are of concern going on in the Commonwealth at the same time opening up to any and every question uh, that could be asked. I think it's a, a healthy way to approach it, which again, we're, we're all looking for ways all of us, media, government, and so many others to engage people and to get people real information that can be verified and, and questioned and in a day and age where some people get all their news from a buddy on Facebook. You know, we think that this is an important way to try to get um, um, facts out. I still believe in facts. Yes, uh, our plan, um, and, unless we're out of town, um, is to have them uh, every Thursday. And, and that will mean sometimes we, we, we push some information to Thursday so we can do it in an organized fashion. But it also means that uh, the governor's answer questions every Thursday. Somebody's a millionaire today. Do they know yet? <laughs> so I can't talk about where we are exactly in that drawing, but I am really excited. Uh, we got a Kentuckian that is going to, uh, before taxes, uh, win a million dollars uh, today. We're going to have five um, uh, young adults in Kentucky uh, that are going to ensure that they can pay for their higher education of their choice. Um, it's a sprint.
from when the drawing is done to ensuring all the verifications are, are done. This is our first time. Feel good about how it's going. I look forward to tomorrow when we're able to announce it. Vaccine numbers rise a lot since that announcement, and do you anticipate it to go up again? So in, in Ohio, they did. Uh, but the way that the vaccine numbers come in through Tiberius, that's the federal system, has changed too. And that's because their people are taking off on the weekends now too. So if you've noticed, if you look at them every day, it's 1,000 people vaccinated, 3,000 people vaccinated, 16,000 people vaccinated. And, and that makes it a little bit harder to see the day-to-day -day trend. Um, but, but I am convinced on the numbers since we've announced it that it is spurring interest. And remember, we haven't had, handed anybody a check yet. That can also spur a, a little bit of interest. Uh, the drawing is conducted by a number of different uh, state agencies together um, in a, 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 a pretty long process that is also documented to ensure uh, it's, it is fair. And at least to my knowledge, I don't know anybody has won. So I'm, I'm sorry to everybody here. All right. Uh, again, uh, thank you all very much. We'll be back next Thursday.